It was one of those unthinkable tragedies that turns private people into household names. It happened last fall. In one terrible moment, the world came to know little Nicholas Green and his family. But their tragedy is not the end of our story. It's the beginning of an inspiring saga, a really uplifting testament to human goodness. Shortly after losing their only son, the Greens made an incredible decision. With their own grief so new, they were able to offer the gift of life to people they had never met. Now Bob Brown takes you on this family's unforgettable journey, the road from profound loss to the deep gratitude of an entire nation. Let me show you a room of a boy who will always be seven years old. In here, there are soldiers and castles and sports cars and books, all the things that make children dream. Like a lot of kids, Nicholas Green was already working hard on his imagination. Light, camera, action. He especially liked the stories behind the myths and legends of other lands, because he was also a traveler who accompanied his parents on long vacations from their home in Bodega Bay, California. Last fall, they went off to see Italy, where this seven-year-old's discoveries were ended by a random act of violence. On Friday, September 29th, the family stopped among these ruins at Pestum in southern Italy. Nicholas and his mother, Margaret, wandered off to look at one of the limestone temples. Those were among the last moments they spent alone together. Nicholas and I walked around it, and, and we looked up, and we saw four white doves. And I pointed out that white doves would have, would have been a, sim, a symbol of, of messengers from the gods, and I wondered what, what they would mean. And then, and then two of them flew away. Um, and I told Nicholas that it was, uh, made me think of children leaving home. Uh, uh, and I, I, I gave him a special hug because, you know, thinking years down the road when, when he would be leaving um, and how, how sad I would be. Later that day, the father, British-born Reginald Green, drove the family down this highway toward a ferry to Sicily. Suddenly, hijackers pulled alongside them and, in an attempt to force them off the road, fired four shots into the Green's car. Mr. Green was able to outrun the other auto, but Nicholas, asleep in the back seat with his younger sister, Eleanor, had been struck in the head by a bullet. He was later pronounced brain dead at a hospital in Messina, Sicily. What happened next struck the conscience of the entire country and its political leaders, including then-President Oscar Scalfaro. Margaret and Reginald Green responded to the violence with an uncommon act of humanity. They offered to donate Nicholas's organs for transplant to Italian patients. The doctors felt perhaps a little shy about asking, but it was clear to us that that was um, that what needed to be done. Were you able to say your goodbyes in the midst of everything that was happening? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, I mean, looking back, I think if I'd, if, um, I wish I'd taken more time. It was very, very painful. Um, but perhaps if I could have stood the pain, I would have had sort of more memories. Um, when his brain was dead and he was being kept alive by the machines, uh, you know, his body, I, anyway, it was important to, to say that goodbye to. Seven Italians who we'll meet later received transplants from Nicholas. Two men, one described as affiliated with a crime family in the region of Calabria, eventually were arrested for the murder. Do you uh, have any feelings uh, left about the men who did this? To us, they're cardboard figures, really, at the moment. Now, when we go to trial, then, of course, they'll be three-dimensional, and they'll have families who surely are grieved by all this. I mean, there are no winners in this. You know, that's one of the dreadful things about it. We're all lost. Their families are lost, they'll lose. Four days after Nicholas's death, the Green family went home for funeral services for their son and brother. We will always think of Nicholas as a vibrant, truthful, imaginative little boy, said his father. Through letters and calls, the Greens were also becoming aware of some of the effects of the decision they had made in Italy. One of the letters came from a 14-year-old girl, Anna Maria de Celia, who is now living with one of Nicholas's kidneys. Thanks to you, my life has changed. I don't have to do dialysis anymore, and I can drink as much water as I want. I've gone back to school, and it was a wonderful welcome of kisses and hugs. 
Now I'm a normal girl, and I'm ready to live my own life. Thank you again. Especially here in the south of Italy, the story of what the Greens had done continued to grow long after they had gone home. According to a European Union report, Italians have the lowest rate of organ donation in all of Europe. But a dramatic increase late last year, helping boost donations in Italy by an estimated 25% for 1994, was quickly dubbed Le Feto Nicolas, the Nicolas Effect. School children in many Italian towns talked and wrote about Nicholas Green as a symbol of caring. And because so many ceremonies were planned in his name, the Greens, much sooner than they ever had anticipated, agreed to return. February 1995, less than five months after the tragedy, they were back in Messina, Sicily, where Nicholas had died, in a sense, to complete their interrupted journey as a tribute to their son. They were scheduled to meet most of the transplant recipients at a ceremony in this theater in Messina. But 19-year-old Maria Pia Pedala, who had been lying near death in a coma when she received Nicholas's liver, went to meet them even before they left the lobby of their hotel. I don't have words to express myself. There really aren't words. What they gave, what I received, it was so heroic of them. After Maria, the 14-year-old recipient of one of Nicholas's kidneys, Anna Maria de Celia, appeared shyly with her father, anxious to give a gift to Nicholas's five-year-old sister, Eleanor. The main event of that morning was a ceremony sponsored by Messina's Bonino Palejo Foundation, which offers annual awards for scientific and social achievement. The Greens were included among this year's honorees. And the living evidence of their extraordinary gift the recipients of Nicholas's organs came to sit with them on stage. Joining Maria Pia Pedala and Anna Maria de Celia were a beaming, lively 11-year-old Tino Motto, who had lost the function of both his kidneys, and without the transplant of a kidney from Nicholas Green would still be hooked to hospital machinery. The corneas from Nicholas's eyes were given to a 30-year-old school teacher, Domenica Galetta, and a 43-year-old salesman, Francesco Mondello allowing them to see clearly again. Sylvia Ciampi, a 31-year-old with a rare pancreatic condition, received insulin from Nicholas's pancreas. Only the seventh recipient, the boy with Nicholas's heart, 15-year-old Andrea Mongiardi, was not in good enough health to attend, but he had said after his transplant that he hoped Nicholas's younger sister, Eleanor, would now consider him her brother. There were some very exhilarating moments. But uh, then I suddenly remembered, you know, how it all came about. And then, among all these honors and hopes, the ever-recurring stab of pain. And Nicholas is not here to share them. They're hard to give away because they remind me so much of him. But there are others... Margaret Green carried with her small toys from Nicholas's room. They were a part of him she wanted each recipient to have. And later that day, she presented one of the first to Francesco Mondello, the salesman who received a cornea from Nicholas. Mondello's sight is crucial to him. His job requires him to drive. Which one is Nicholas's eye? He told the Greens that he wanted his children to think about the values of life and the courage of the Greens, and how strange it was, he said, that violence bringing death returns a part of life. The Greens also experienced unforgettable moments in villages near the Sicilian coast, places that had no connection with any of the recipients of Nicholas's organs, but which wanted to offer their support to the Green family. At the bottom of a hill outside the town of Saponara, crowds of villagers who'd been waiting till dusk for a glimpse of the American family surged around them until they were all headed up the hill in a twilight parade. The greens passed and the crowds parted, sometimes reaching out to touch them. That square was just thronged with people around who wanted to comfort us. You know, wanted to reach out and say, you know, we're sorry and uh, anything we can do. One very strong lesson for me is the fundamental decency of people. 
The treasures and paintings Saponaro most wanted to show the Greens were just off the town square. In a church named for the patron saint of children, St. Nicholas. We think of Nicholas as our school friend. Bravo! Bravo. On this night, the focus of Saponara was on its children, thanks to the seven-year-old Nicholas Green. The town dedicated a tree of peace in honor of Nicholas, and the mayor pledged to plant a new tree every year for every child born in the village. The family hardly got a chance for sightseeing, with ceremony after ceremony lasting late into the night. It was almost as if the country the Greens had come to see still lay beyond them, with only occasional opportunities to wander. In the Nebrodi Mountains, Reginald Green went off to see a 2,000-year-old Temple of Hercules overlooking the Mediterranean, a place he knew Nicholas would have loved. You know, he had such a zest for life. He, uh, he wanted to know about everything. If a hint of his curiosity could help trace a memory of their son, the evidence of his life was there in the touch of a hand, as Margaret Green walked with Maria Pia Pedala through the streets of Taranova on Monday, February 6th. Taranova is Maria's hometown. Her family and friends filled the ceremonies to formally welcome the Greens, and she thought about the reversal in her life, from the knowledge that she was dying only six months before to the awareness of life she has today. A month before the transplant, day after day, I worsened. You could see the difference. And then, after the transplant, I got better day by day. Now, I feel reborn. The scene for which the entire town had prepared occurred after the welcome out in the sunshine. The Greens and Maria and crowds of waiting people walked to the school that Maria attended as a child. Their song said, thank you forever, Mr. and Mrs. Green. All the children of the world say thanks. The school was renamed on this day. It is now the Nicholas Green Elementary School. And the Greens, who had been noted for their composure throughout their ordeal, trembled with emotion when the ceremony for their son ended with the Star Spangled Banner. There was so much life um, um, in that in that little group of smiling faces. That was what the thing that struck me most. Just it, this, this incident has seemed to bring people closer together. It was a closeness magnified by the extremes of the cruelty that caused this to happen and the beauty of its effects. Reminders that for every second that passes, while some are hanging on to life, others are letting go. But seldom are they so aware of each other as they were on this journey people who otherwise had no reason to meet, but whose lives became connected as absolutely as if they had been linked at birth. Have you tried to communicate how you feel to the Green family? Yes, I tried to as much as I could, but by seeing my tears, they can realize what I feel for them. Nicholas is alive, he lives in me, and we will grow together. Nicholas is, is buried in a, um, in a country churchyard. Last time I went up to visit the grave, there was a little, um, little action figure, a little soldier was, was left there by some school friend, I don't know. It's something that's really touched people. My God, Bob. What a great world this would be if there was a higher percentage of people like those parents. As you know, I know you know that they contacted UNICEF shortly after the boy's death and said they wanted to help find some way to shield parents and families from this kind of tragedy all over the world. So at the U.S. Committee, we were proud to set up the uh, Nicholas Green Memorial Fund. 
Right, and one of the one of the goals of the fund is to prevent the the unnecessary death of, of children. Exactly. In the early days, it was thought not wise to bring together the recipients of donors. That was definitely one of the schools of thought because intellectually, what if you didn't like the person who who received the organ, or what if the person didn't survive? Then was, do you go through a whole new process of grief if that doesn't happen? But emotionally, some people feel it's a tremendous help for them to know where the organ went. I asked the Greens that question and they both said they, they thought it was a help and they're glad to have seen the life passed along to the people who are now sharing it. Marvelous story. Thank you, Bob.